Well, I'm Dennis McQuistion, and today's program is about money, deficits, debt, government bonds, inflation, and it will affect you whether you want it to or not. So some of the questions we'll ask and answer are, what is modern monetary theory? Secondly, we'll talk about budget deficits. What are they? Is it, are they a problem? Is budget uh, deficit a bigger problem than anything else? Do we have government debt that is or is not a problem? How does all this impact inflation and how does it impact unemployment? Those are the things we're gonna be talking about. And to help us, we have two experts. One is Alexander William Salter. He's the Georgie G. Snyder Associate Professor of Economics in the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. He's also the Comparative Economics Research Fellow at Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and a senior fellow with the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project. His latest book is Money and the Rule of Law. And joining us from out west in uh, Portland at the moment is L. Randall Ray. He's a senior scholar at the Levy Institute, Economics Institute, I should say, and professor of economics at Bard College. He is one of the original developers of modern monetary theory. And his most recent books are Why Minsky Matters, and Minsky is an economist, for those of you who know, and also a great leap forward. So Randall, welcome to the program. And so would you be kind enough to tell that viewer what modern monetary theory is and why it's important today? Okay, yes. So very briefly, modern money theory or MMT uh, has been developed over the past 25 years or so as a framework to analyze fiscal and monetary policy that's applicable to national governments that issue their own, what we call sovereign currencies. There are four requirements that identify whether you have a sovereign currency or not. The first is the government chooses a money of account in the US, the dollar. It imposes obligations, taxes, fees, fines, and so on. Today, mostly taxes in that money of account. It issues a currency that it accepts in payment of those obligations. And if the national government issues other obligations, such as bonds, they're also payable in the nation's own currency. So what difference does it make whether you have a sovereign currency or not? We argue that the sovereign currency issuer does not face a budget constraint as we conventionally define those. So it's not like a household or a firm. It cannot run out of money. It can always meet its obligations by paying in its own currency. Uh, it can set the interest rate wherever it wants on the obligations it issues in its own currency. Before the coronavirus hit, all of our critics claimed we were calling on the Fed to fly helicopters and drop bags of money into people's backyards that would flood the economy with money and cause hyperinflation. Um, MMT was dismissed as crazy talk. And then ironically, when the pandemic hit, MMT was embraced, at least for a while, to uh, justify the uh, checks that the government was mailing out. So it's hilarious to us because we never advocated such a thing. Uh, we actually did not support quantitative easing when the Fed was pumping reserves into banks, and we didn't support uh, indiscriminate mailing of checks to all households. What we actually say is the procedures that have been adopted by the Fed, by the Treasury, and by private banks uh, are adequate uh, in order to finance all government spending up to the budget that's been approved by Congress and signed by the president. What we emphasize is that sovereign governments face not financial constraints, but real resource constraints. Um, too much spending, whether it's by the government or by the private sector, can cause inflation if it pushes the economy beyond full employment of its domestic resources. Below full employment, we are living below our means. And the answer is for the government and the private sector to spend more, to mobilize all of our 
nation's resources. Alex, you, you're familiar with MMT and you've heard uh, his comments, your thoughts. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. And first, let me say hello and nice to meet you to Professor Ray. Uh, I actually read your works when I was a graduate student, so I'm thrilled to be uh, here speaking to you now. When I look at MMT, I see not so much as an economic theory that purports to describe the causal relationships in the economy, as I do see a policy toolkit for policymakers, whether we're talking about fiscal agents or monetary agents. And that's fine. We can move the conversation into the policy space. But then we have to tackle head on this idea that the public sector does not have a budget constraint as conventionally defined. Now, I think that there's a lot going on in that word conventional. Strictly speaking, it's correct. Uncle Sam could always run the printing presses to pay its debts or to finance spending. There's no reason that we have to borrow anything from the bond market at all. But when we say that the government doesn't have a budget constraint, we should not take that to mean that the government does not confront trade-offs. Borrowing has a cost, not borrowing has a cost. Paying bondholders has a cost, defaulting has a cost. Printing money to cover our bills has a cost, not doing that has a cost. So I think we need to be much more precise about exactly what those costs are, and that will enable us to have the policy conversation that MMT as a paradigm is designed to make us have. All right, well, let me ask you then, Randy, because for those of us who are not economists, when we talk about uh, spending restraints, we talk about budget deficits. Um, we've run budget deficits almost exclusively for the past 50 or 60 years, in spite of the fact that, that we sort of had a, a budget. Are you suggesting with MMT that there's no difference, that we still have a budget, but instead of borrowing money to cover it, that we just print money effectively? And I know you're not really printing money, but you're using the Fed to adjust bank reserves. Can you tell us whether that would change under modern monetary theory? No change. As I said, the current procedures that we adopt allow the government to spend up to whatever Congress authorizes. We, there's no such thing as deficit spending. There is no special procedure adopted when the government is running a deficit. In fact, we don't know if there's a deficit or not until the end of the accounting period, okay? The end of the fiscal year when we total up the spending, total up the tax revenue, subtract one from the other and find out if we had a deficit, a surplus or a balanced budget over the course of the year. The way that we spend doesn't change in any way whatsoever, uh, regardless of what that outcome is. All right, so if that's the case, then uh, Alex, what would be the problem with modern monetary theory from your perspective if, if that doesn't change? The problem I think is that modern monetary theorists are not cautious enough about the prospects of inflation. Professor Ray does admit that if we push the economy's demand beyond what the economy can sustainably produce, we're going to have price increases. What's everybody talking about right now in the economy? Widespread price increases. Now, I would actually argue that the reason that we're seeing inflation right now is due to supply considerations. We've all heard about the supply bottlenecks that are lingering from the pandemic. Container ships waiting outside of the port because they can't find people to unload the ships. Trains backed up by a mile at uh, rail depots. All these things are contributing to a supply problem. And that was largely unforeseen. What that means is it's really hard to know whether or not we're living within our means real time because what is within our means changes. And if we're going to conduct economic activity by running the printing press, we could quickly find ourselves in an inflationary scenario which gets out of control. I don't think we're there right now. I'm just not as confident as Professor Ray and some other modern monetary theorists that we can make these judgments accurately enough in real time to not invite worse economic consequences. All right, so Randy, I'm gonna put up um, graphic number 10, which is one of the slides you sent me. And since you can't see it, you need to define for us what you think true inflation or let's just say semi-inflation is and the connection that you see with that and full employment. And it's also explained what you consider full employment to be. Yeah, well, clearly what we have now is semi-inflation. Semi-inflation occurs due to bottlenecks. Supply side problems, I absolutely agree that our problem today uh, is on the supply side, not on the demand side. Uh, we still have, uh, we're still way below full employment of labor resources. Uh, 
uh, uh, we're nowhere near the same labor force participation rate that we had before COVID hit. Now, there's a, a wide variety of reasons for this. It's not an easy problem to resolve, but this is a case of semi-inflation. Uh, true inflation occurred during World War II. In World War II, we were operating well beyond the economy's capacity. And uh, it, true inflation resulted, but we kept it in check. Uh, we used a variety of policies and many listeners will have heard of these even if they didn't live through the war. Uh, we had uh, wage and price controls. We imposed some taxes. We had patriotic savings uh, and we had some rationing. And that's how we kept inflation below 10% for the first time in a major war in US history. That's what you do to tackle true inflation. You do have to reduce spending and that's what we did. Okay, Alex, you can re react to that. Now I'm gonna ask you both about a government debt. So go ahead. Sure, I'm not actually familiar with the distinction between semi-inflation and true inflation. I take a more orthodox perspective on these questions, which is inflation means prices are going up, not for particular goods and services, but throughout the economy as a whole. In other words, inflation means the same thing as a falling purchasing power of the dollar. So I don't think it makes a whole lot of theoretical sense to distinguish between categorical kinds of inflation, depending on whether the economy is producing more or less than its potential. I think it's more helpful to shift this discussion from spending to what's going on with the money supply on the one hand, and how fast those dollars are turning over on the other hand. If you look at recent data, especially government deficits being larger or smaller than anticipated, don't seem to have very much effect on the overall expensiveness of goods and services. But aggregate demand changes driven by monetary policy, those do have those big consequences. And so I think that we're still play playing in the same, the same sandbox that Milton Friedman bequeathed to us. All right. So before I go back to Randy, Alex, um, you, both of you talked about inflation as sort of an increase in prices. The monetarist, I think, would say, and, and Milton Friedman would say that uh, inflation is really the definition is an increase in the supply of money or credit, and that causes those increases in prices. Would you agree with that, Alex? Um, actually, I would disagree with that a little bit. I would say that that definition of inflation comes from an older generation of economists, sometime between 1900 and 1920, typically associated with what we call the Austrian school. And I actually have a great fondness for the Austrian school. So I think it's neat that you brought up that definition. Nonetheless, I think that those uh, scholars would disagree with someone in the Chicago tradition, like Milton Friedman, who really talks about it in terms of what's going on with overall prices. And so if you look at the money supply, just because the money supply is going up doesn't mean that prices are going to go up. It's like with all other goods and services, you need to know about supply and demand. If money supply and the demand to hold money are going up equally fast, there's not gonna be any inflation. So in order to get sustained inflation, you need money supply increasing faster than the demand to hold money. That's the key. But isn't that what isn't that what's happened, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years? And the only difference is, uh, is that the turnover rate has slowed significantly. After the 2008 financial crisis, we didn't have much inflation at all. The Federal Reserve had a really, really hard time getting inflation up to its self-adopted 2% target. In fact, it missed it for a decade straight. Since the pandemic ended, or rather since the economic fallout from the first round, the pre-Delta variant uh, sort of started easing, that's when we've started seeing market price increases. So on the one hand, you did see changes in money demand that are more commensurate with inflation. On the other hand, you have these supply problems that both I and Professor Ray have both pointed out. So I think that there's a fundamental difference between the way that monetary policy was working over the last 10 years versus how it started working circa March 2020. Okay, thanks. Now, Randy, I had the opportunity back in the 90s to interview Jim Buchanan, Nobel Prize winner and economist, and one of the co-founders of the Public Choice. And I asked him if deficits mattered, and he said yes. I also asked him about government debt, if that mattered. So talk to us about the level of government debt. The direct debt is about almost 30 trillion now here in the, the late uh, 2021. And does it matter if that just continues? It's gone from five to 30 in the last 21 years. Does that bother you? Oh, look, uh, the debt ratio, which is the way we need to look at the debt because the economy is growing all the time. 
uh, the debt ratio has grown since the founding of the nation at a rate of almost 2% per year. So earlier you said for the past 50 years or whatever, actually deficits are absolutely normal for the, uh, the past, since the founding of the nation. Um, we've only had seven periods in which the government ran a budget surplus and they were very short lived. The first six were followed by great depressions. Uh, and the last one was followed by the global financial crisis. So I think that there is some kind of a correlation uh, there. Uh, deficits are normal. Growing debt ratios are normal. Uh, the apocalypse has never occurred <laughs> yet. Uh, something that can go on for 200 years, I start to think maybe it can go on a few more years longer. The debt is uh, the government's IOU to us. So we need to look at um, both sides of the equation. When the government runs a deficit, that means the rest of us get to run a surplus. We spend less than our income when the government is spending more than its income. Let's put up graphic number 13. Would you tell uh, Alex basically what that says? It's a, a graph that plots the government's balance and the non-government's balance, which is the uh, domestic private sector plus the foreign uh, balance against the United States. So we call that the non-government sector's balance. And of course, the two have to balance. When the government deficit increases, the non-government sectors taken as a whole, uh, surplus increases by identity. Now we can separate out the foreign sector uh, and what we will still find is that uh, our domestic private sector's balance moves in the opposite direction. Uh, uh, to the movement of the government sector's balance. As the government sector's deficit increases, the domestic private sector surplus increases. So that is our net financial saving. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Alex, talk to us about the debt from your standpoint. Does that matter to you that where we are, not to mention the unfunded liabilities of in excess of 100 trillion? The unfunded liabilities do worry me, and I think that we can talk about that in a little bit. First, I'd like to say that I do agree with Professor Ray that as soon as government takes on debt, there are beneficiaries and there are people who are going to bear those costs. So in the aggregate, we need to figure out what that spending is going to be used on to figure out whether it's productive or not. Government takes out a loan, it's going to repay the bondholders. It's going to have a future tax burden imposed on someone to pay for it. And this was Jim Buchanan's point, who you said that you interviewed. The person who bears the cost of public finance when it takes on a debt is what the political process in the future determines who's going to bear that tax liability. So I think we have two things to worry about. First, in the future, obviously various political coalitions are not going to be the ones left, not wanting to be the ones left holding the bag. And so they're going to expend resources on influencing the political process to make sure that someone else pays the bill and that can be worrisome and wasteful. Secondly, I think you also have to worry about what this money is being spent on. And most of the time when we run deficits, it's not to finance productive investments, it's to finance current consumption, especially transfer payments. And so to the extent that we're drawing down private sector savings, even if they're voluntarily supplied by people who are willing to purchase those bonds, to the extent that we're withdrawing, or excuse me, drawing down private capital stocks to finance consumption rather than future production, I do have to worry about the effects of that on economic growth. Now, they might not be very large, but I think that they are there. All right, Randy, uh, from the MMT perspective, uh, Stephanie Kelton is someone you know, of course, and she wrote a recent book on it. She was the uh, economic advisor to Bernie Sanders and his presidential run. So does spending on just to say investment type things versus consumption or transfer payments matter? Uh, and is this why we see, uh, you know, progressives uh, pushing for another few trillion dollars in spending? Okay. Uh, MMT is mostly a description of the way things work. Uh, it is not ideological. And we have uh, conservatives who um, have adopted MMT as a way to understand the way the government really spends. We also have progressives who have adopted that. So, I mean, it's definitely not a socialist agenda. 
Uh, are there socialists who adopt this framework? Yes, there are. Are there conservatives? Are there free market types? Yes, there are. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have policies I prefer. Uh, and yes, I am a progressive. But MMT by itself is not. I've written a, 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 a short article. MMT is for Austrians too. I want everyone to understand how the government really spends and then push their own agendas, okay? And we all want that. Does it matter what the government spends on? Absolutely, I agree with what he said. Uh, it does matter, but we leave nobody holding a bag in the future. We are never going to retire all the government debt. We have only retired it one time, 1837. That was the last time we retired all the debt. We will never retire the debt. Don't worry about the bag. Nobody's going to pay this off. Yeah, but Randy, let me interrupt you for a second. One of the things, of course, that, that economists worry about is the sometimes called the surcharge, but it's the interest on the debt that has to be. And at these low rates, it's not all that much, but it, it, let's say more normalized rates, it's going to be a lot more. Does that matter? Well, it does matter in the sense that when we pay interest, that interest is flowing as an income to the holders of government debt. Uh, about 40% of government debt typically is held abroad. We are paying interest on the debt held abroad. And the rest is held by institutions in America and by individuals in America. There could be uh, impacts on inequality of paying interest to high income bond holders. If the interest rate is high, we will be spending more on interest income. So I think that uh, the equity issues do make a difference. Can the government always afford to pay that interest? Yes. Okay. Well, but, but you believe that um, the Fed can continue to keep interest rates down forever or that the government should control interest rates? Is that true? Well, the Fed is part of government. It's a creature of Congress. And yes, the Fed is the one that sets the overnight rate. The bills rate, which is the 30-day government debt, closely tracks that. And the others are um, sort of based off whatever the Fed's target is. Um, and yes, this is completely within the control of the Fed. And uh, I don't think the Fed is going to do another Volcker. We're not going to go to another 20% interest rates. I think that that is a thing of the past. Uh, yep. I think the Fed is committed to lower rates. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. So Alex, I'm going to ask you to Give me about 30 seconds or a minute in response to what Randy said and anything else you'd like to add before we close. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I think at the end of the day, what we need to be focusing on is the following question. What's the priority for the public sector right now? What do we actually want the government to do in terms of regulation, transfer payments, overseeing markets? And once we answer those questions, I think we can have a discussion about public finance that helps us realize those goals that we may hold collectively, severally. However, that's channeled through the political process. I don't see any reason to overturn the standard way of thinking about public finance. I don't think that there's anything wrong or limiting about the idea that we have a public sector, sector entity, or rather the public sector as a whole, borrowing money rather than paying its bills by using the prerogative of the Federal Reserve to create the monetary base. I think that there are costs and benefits to either decision. I think Professor Ray's point about we need to understand how the money is actually spent does matter. We should definitely talk about that. But we can't get around this fundamental policy consideration of if we do it by printing money, we're going to have inflation. What are the costs of that? If we do it by deficit finance, we might have difficulty repaying and there are other costs associated with that. Let's actually focus on the trade-offs here and that can actually be the backbone of our economic analysis. Well, let me just say to both of you, uh, Randy, you and Alex, a great um, discussion. And for that person watching this program, let me just say to you, read about modern monetary theory. Read about John Maynard Keynes who uh, that particular theory comes from, and I, I think, Randy, looking at your stuff, you call yourself a post-Kantian. A post Read also Hayek, Friedrich von Hayek's writings, and understand whether you think the government can spend money better than you can, and whether they know more as to how to do that. Uh, Friedrich Hayek's famous paper in, 18, in 1945 talking about the limits of knowledge, that's one of the things in 
Unfortunately, I think both of you would agree with both political parties not being able to agree on what time it is, much less what they should do. That's a challenge. Keynes had a great quote. He said, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Your job as a viewer is to decide which economist is defunct. So you've heard two very smart people with different ideas on monetary policy. Read, as I said, all those things and understand the market economy and MMT and how those things go. Social media is something we want you to follow us on. TV.com. Watch these programs for other subjects like this because we always provide perspectives on things that matter with people who care.